Good afternoon. I'm Kim Bloom. Welcome to this news briefing from the 250th National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in Boston. We're joined today by Dr. Teresa Dankovich from Carnegie Mellon University. She's going to talk about the drinkable book she has developed to bring clean water to people who might otherwise not have access to it. Dr. Dankovich. Thank you. Um, I have a copy of the drinkable book with me. It looks like a regular book, except you can flip in and see, oh, these are these bright orange weird pages, and they're rather thick if you get close to it. Um, so what the book has is silver nanoparticles, which is highly toxic to bacteria. And during my PhD at McGill University, I demonstrated that these, with just in the lab, with um, lab-cultured bacteria, that they could eliminate um, several orders of magnitude of bacteria and thus provide clean drinking water. Um, well, the potential for that. Um, after my PhD, I went to the University of Virginia where I did my first postdoc. Um, and this was with Jim Smith, who um, is, has a collaborator, he's a prof professor in civil and environmental engineering, as a collaborator in um, South Africa where we did our first field trials of this technology. That, actually there's no pictures of South Africa in the slides, but this is um, me in Ghana, which is the second field trials we did with uh, million NGO people Water die is each Life, year from water is also working with me on this project. But the even bigger problem, most of them don't cover. even know Water is um, unsafe and to so drink the, in the results first place. I presented at the That's why water is life. Partnering with scientists and engineers at Carnegie Mellon from the University Africa, of Virginia Ghana, to invent a solution that solves both of these problems. That's me Introduce the, the drinkable book, boy, the first um, ever tool that teaches. And I brought one of the designs from Bangladesh here. This is a kolshi, which is a, a water collection vessel, um, and you can just see it's just got a plastic funnel and the paper folded like you would fold for any type of lab filtration with paper. Um, and uh, so yeah, I presented those results on Sunday and the results were that the paper was highly effective at nine, uh, average of 99% effective at removing uh, bacteria from these natural water sources. Um, let's see, what's the last slide again? <laughs> yeah, just pictures of the book. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, our next steps are um, right now, all the, these papers have been made either by myself or students in the lab and also in a church kitchen to get it kind of a larger scale. They have larger ovens, there's a heat treatment step. Um, and we want to be able to do this at a much larger production run than just a few hours in a church kitchen here and there. Um, so we're looking to scale production at paper facilities, pilot paper facilities. And also we'd like to do a much more involved field study where we have health monitoring and also water quality monitoring um, for various, uh, like pick a few villages in some of these um, locations like Bangladesh and um, Ghana. Um, and we, uh, uh, I think that's about it. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Uh, we can turn to the audience for some questions. Um, before you answer any questions, just uh, please do wait for the microphone and, and use your, uh, your name and your affiliation. Chemistry and Industry Magazine. Um, I'm just interested to know, why did you put this in paper? And uh, I mean, how, how did that idea come about? And also, how do you actually make it at the moment? Um, well, so I, my PhD, as I said before, was at McGill University, which is um, long tradition or has a long tradition of pulp and paper research in being in Canada, where that's a big industry. Um, and so the research was originally sponsored by um, a, what was called the Bioactive Paper Network or Sentinel, the Bioactive Paper Network. Um, and so that their goals were to make paper either antimicrobial for air or water filtration, uh, to be able to detect pathogens, and an all assortment of things related to those topics. So there was, I mean, it was a large research network, 10 different universities, you know, 50 to, I don't know, 70 researchers. A lot of people were involved with it. Um, so the original work came out of that. And paper, of course, is very cheap, lightweight. It's got a lot of really great material properties. Yeah, that's the other thing I was going to ask. How much does it cost once you've got the... I mean, as, the main cost book. is related to the cost of the paper itself. The amount of silver in it is, like, less than 1 weight percent. So 
the paper is considerably thick and it's been treated also to be strong while it's wet, which, um, you know, so there's those factors. That works in three steps. Simply take out a filter, you also put slide it into the custom yeah. filter box um, and pour contaminated copper, water through. Uh, the what copper comes out is safe to drink. I developed during my the content on each page, at printed in Virginia, food grade I ink, educates not bring people about me today, water they're habits, like a reddish things that we take for granted, color. such as taking <laughs> trash and feces away from your water source. Does it have but other, the best part of the book isn't just that it purifies water or teaches proper sanitation, it's the fact that this filter paper will revolutionize water purification. It costs only pennies to produce, making it by far the the cheapest option the on the market of copper needs and to it's be higher to have the same level of each filter is capable of giving um, someone up to 30 days worth of clean water however copper is considerably cheaper than silver so it might be pretty comparable at the end of the day <laughs> also just very quickly what, what bacteria have you been able to remove um, so during my phd i looked at lab grown e coli which is kind of the standard for microbiology testing. Um, and I also looked at Enterococci faecalis, um, which it, those differ by um, the latter being gram positive, E. coli gram negative. Um, we also, with the field water samples, the indicator bacteria, which generally aren't harmful, they're just easy to culture <laughs> on the lab um, facilities, or, or like petri dishes, I mean. Um, that was total coliform bacteria, which basically just means gut bacteria, and that's an indication of um, um, animal feces in the water, essentially. Um, and also E. coli, which is a type of coliform bacteria that's more specific and can potentially cause disease. Yes. Ben Valls, The Chemistry World magazine. Uh, in your field trials, how easy did people find to use it, and how well did it fit into the, uh, the, the current way that they handle water? How different was it for them to have to use the filter compared to what they were already doing? Right. Um, well, in many cases, the answer for already doing was actually nothing. <laughs> so there is that extra step, but people seem to be interested in the fact that it's a very simple thing, you know. It's not like <laughs> it involves pumps or you have to plug something in. It's just pouring into a container. Um, the so that part wasn't really too hard to show people. Um, it, I think, uh, yeah. In general, it seemed to be pretty, pretty usually pretty accepted and for the most part and a lot of people were really I mean we aren't selling this yet so a lot of people were very excited to know when this might be available and <laughs> would ask questions like oh can I have one now and <laughs> um, so yeah it, I mean I would say the only drawback which is true for all filters not in this filter paper but is if it's really turbid water has a lot of suspended solids in it it's that's when people would become frustrated but uh, honestly, that, that was the only thing that we saw. Do you think there is the potential to include uh, other active compounds into the paper? So maybe something that would change colour in response to arsenic or heavy metals? And, yeah. And so do you think that the water book at the moment could actually be the basis for a much bigger project? Oh, definitely. And there's been all sorts of uh, <laughs> things that we've been brainstorming that just obviously there isn't that much time in a day. But like there's um, we really would love to have an indicator system to tell people when to replace the paper. And I'm not sure how that if that's going to be based on like uh, actual detection of bacteria or maybe just a way that you can tell something's leached, that the silver is leached out to it below a certain level. It, it could be either one, but um, yeah. And then there's, we've also had talked about some sort of pre-filter that could be added to the system, not necessarily added to the paper. I'm not, it, the design part of that is still evolving. <laughs> but yeah, it'd be really interesting to um, see what else we could do with it. Thank you. Hi, Doug Dollamore, Science Elements Podcast. I'm wondering how this system compares either in effectiveness or uh, um, time 
or uh, a cost in comparison to say the 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 water for purification powders that are already on the market that you pour in and, and right. wait a few minutes. Um, so you're talking about like pure. <laughs> um, so from the best of my knowledge, pure is a coagulation system with bleach or chlorine added to it. Um, and as far as I know, that that's a bit more expensive. I think they're a dollar per shot, and it's like 10 liters that you can clean with it, if I remember right. Um, we're aiming to have the price of this be in the pen, like less than 10 cents, even as low as a penny if possible. We want it to, to be really affordable for um, you know for anyone to use. Um, and our field tests have shown that it's just as effective as um, other uh, water purifiers out there. In terms of the capacity, um, we have estimated that, well, this is a slightly larger paper, but one of these little squares in the book, this, there's two filters on each page, that one of those filters could last around 100 liters of water, or not last, uh, purify 100 liters of water before there's too little um, silver to be effective. Yeah, at um, probably one tenth of the cost, but at this rate, we're also, we're not at production scale, so the numbers might change. <laughs> uh, Matt Gunther, Chemistry World magazine. Um, I was wondering, actually, you've got the filter there in a conical shape. How how important is the final shape on the efficiency of the filter? Well, that's something that we just started investigating in the last few months. So I don't have a definitive answer at this point. <laughs> um, it seems like from our initial trials, it's very comparable, Like, it, but we, I think, would probably absorb a bit more turbidity in the cone shape, or not absorb, but um, it'd be held up in the filter um, than the flat. But at the same time, we need to do more, more rigorous testing before I could say absolutely. ACS new service. Um, when you're making these paper, uh, papers, it, it's, is the, or are the nanoparticles surface deposited or generated in, in place, or do you have, have a kind of a formula where you take paper pulp and then start, uh, start manufacturing the th uh, thing where it's distributed kind of randomly in the, in right. the paper? Um, so what we've done, uh, actually I have a couple publications, um, that one came out last year, another uh, I guess four years ago now, uh, that have discussed this in depth, but it's essentially, a, it deposits the nanoparticles on the surface of the fibers, um, and it's done uh, in situ where you have a silver salt that gets reduced on the pulp, the like finished paper. It's not done as you have your pulp and then made into a sheet. Um, Although it depends, it might evolve depending upon what manufacturing techniques make the most sense later on. Now, when when you uh, pour the contaminated water on the on the filter, and then it, uh, obviously you tested what what comes through. Have you looked at what was left on the filter? Yeah. Presumably, you can kind of run the thing dry, and so the, the, there is. O only a wet piece of paper there. So, are right. are, part uh, are these particles killing off things uh, things just because they're there, or is there some some live bacteria left on the on the surface? Well, um, so essentially, what happens is the fibers themselves with the nanoparticles on the surface. Uh, well, the nanoparticles have silver ions or copper ions on the surface of the nanoparticles, and they release these ions in the aqueous solution, and that gets absorbed by the bacteria, which then passes through the paper. And we've shown that basically all, like a very small percentage of the bacteria retained on the paper, it's the pore size is chosen to be larger than the size of the bacteria to al allow the filter to not get clogged too quickly. Um, but it's also smaller than something like a protozoa, which, um, like Cryptosporidion, which are much more difficult to kill. Like, for instance, chlorine takes uh, four hours to kill 
protozoa and <laughs> that's when you're heavily dosing it with chlorine. So it, you, it's better to just filter those larger um, microorganisms out with a filter than necessarily use chemical disinfection. Um, so there's a, let's see, I think I'm missing the last part of your question. <laughs> Sorry, can you repeat that? Well, thank you. Okay. Dr. Dollamore, Science Elements, once again. So how close are you to commercial production? Where, what are your next steps? Well, we, we need to get up to mass production. That is, I think, our, our biggest step. Um, it's, you know, technology transfer from bench work, chemistry work, lab work, to, to doing this on a pilot paper machine. There's it, some steps that I think might be easy, some steps might be challenging, and we need to really spend a lot of our efforts in um, doing the focus on that part. In addition to, um, as I was saying before, the idea that we want to do the field trials with users to see the health impacts of such a technology. So what we presented today, or yesterday, I should say, was primarily just showing that it's effective in removing bacteria from water sources in those various countries. So what are some of the challenging steps for you? What are the, some of the daunting problems that you have to overcome at, at this point? Well, <laughs> I think a lot of it is, well, related to uh, lack of resources to be able to do a lot of these tests. <laughs> um, it's non-trivial to get a paper um, company to want to work with you. They want to see a lot of, a lot of um, funding come, or, you know, they want to get a lot of money out of whatever you're doing with them. Um, and you, you need to really convince them that it's worth their time. Um, of course, all these countries are far away and hard to get to as well, a lot of these villages. So there's also those travel costs that will make things more, more difficult. Um, Elizabeth Hawkins from Springer. Um, I just wondered why did you decide to package this in the format of a book? And how is that received in the communities that you go into or have you not tried that out yet? Is it positively received or is it something people are confused about? Or? Um, well. Honestly, the book idea came from someone else I was working with, but it sounded like pretty, it just sounded pretty intriguing. So <laughs> I decided, oh, yeah, why not? It's a good way to explain to people. Like, uh, I don't think I mentioned before, but the text in here um, says, like, the water in your village may contain deadly diseases, but each page of this book is a paper filter that will make it safe to drink. And it's written in English up here and down here. This one is in Swahili. So it's meant to be educational, and I really liked that component of the idea, where, I mean, and then it goes on for a few more pages explaining more about um, water filtration, essentially. Um, and so I, I learned from a lot of my field trips that there's varying levels of education in these communities. Some people don't really think it's that important. Some people love the idea. And it really depends on who you're talking to, as, as everything does. <laughs> all right, I think that's all the time we have. Um, thank you so much for that. The archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly backslash ACS Live Boston. And please join us for our next press conference today at 2.30 p.m on preserving fleeting digital information with DNA for future generations. Thank you. That's it.